Jacksonville. The heavy footsteps of emergency medical technicians and the crackling of police radios awakened Susan Denton from a deep sleep to a scene of horror and blood. In the hallway of Chi Omega Sorority House at Florida State University in Tallahassee, her friend Karen Chandler was being loaded onto a kearney. Another sorority sister, Kathy Kleiner, sat dazed on her bed down the hall, blood pouring down her face. Two others had been strangled, Margaret Bowman's body lay in her room, and Lisa Levy died on the way to the hospital. When you realize how close it occurred, you think why was it their room and not our room? You go through all that, said Miss Denton in an interview recently. She still quivers at the memory of the January 1978 attacks and of the sinister stranger with the engaging smile and magnetic appeal who was finally convicted of the rampage, Theodore Robert Bundy. It has been ten years since Ted Bundy was executed in Florida's electric chair. There probably wasn't a day that went by that I didn't think of Lisa and Margaret, said Ms. Denton, who for 14 years worked to make Florida's victim rights laws more sensitive to crime victims. From early 1974 to early 1978, the stranger called Ted stalked young women on college campuses, at shopping malls, in apartment buildings and grade schools in Washington, Oregon, Utah, Idaho, Colorado, and finally Florida. He was the kind of charmer that you would take home to your sister, said David Lee, now with the Florida Game and Freshwater Fish Commission. Two decades ago, on February 15, 1978, as a Pensacola policeman he had spotted a stolen Volkswagen and signaled the driver to pull over. During questioning, the driver kicked Lee's legs out from under him and ran. Lee fired a warning shot, then a second round at the fleeing man. Lee thought he had wounded the man but soon found himself in a struggle over his gun. He finally subdued and arrested the man. It turned out that Lee had apprehended one of the FBI's ten most wanted. The man was a suspect in the murders of the two Chi Omega sisters and Kimberly Leach, a 12-year-old abducted from outside her school in Lake City on February 9, 1978, brutalized and left dead in a deserted hog shed. He was Ted Bundy. As a teen, Bundy was shy and sensitive. At a Seattle crisis center, he counseled the depressed, the alcoholic, the suicidal. He graduated with a degree in psychology from the University of Washington in 1972, designed a program for dealing with habitual criminals and wrote a pamphlet on rape for the King County Crime Commission. Although no one knows for sure how many women Bundy killed, his first victim is believed to be Mary Adams, 18, whose battered body was found in her Seattle bedroom on January 4, 1974. In the next year and a half, police investigated several disappearances and killings of women in the West, some of them since linked to Bundy. He was arrested in August 1975 and convicted in March 1976 of kidnapping Carol Durange in Utah. That fall, he was charged with killing a Michigan nurse in Aspen, Colorado. But he escaped from custody twice, the last time in December 1977. And once again, the murders started mounting. Bob Keppel, chief investigator of the Washington State Attorney General's office, spent Bundy's final days trying to tie him to unsolved crimes. There was no human remains found. We were able to feel he was the one who committed all the murders. He confessed to more than 30 of them, said Keppel, author of The River Man about Bundy's murderous odyssey. Mike Minerva, who defended Bundy in the Chi Omega murders, said prosecutors offered a deal to spare his life if he pleaded guilty to the three Florida slayings in exchange for 75 years in prison. Bundy backed out at the last minute. It made him realize he was going to have to stand up in front of the whole world and say he was guilty. He just couldn't do it, said Minerva who works in the public defender's office in Tallahassee. After 11 years of trials and appeals, then-Florida Governor Bob Martinez signed the final death warrant against Bundy on January 17, 1989. On the night before his execution, Bundy talked of suicide, recalled Bill Hagmeyer, chief of the FBI's National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crimes. We had some discussions about morality and the taking of another life and his concerns about trying to explain to God about his actions, Hagmeyer added. After drafting a will and letters to his mother, wife and daughter, there was one more thing the killer wanted. He wanted to rehearse his execution, Hagmeyer said. I talked him through it, 
the mechanics of it, I'm afraid to die, Bundy told him. The sun was peeking over the horizon on January 24, 1989, when a black hooded executioner turned a switch that sent 2,000 volts through Bundy's body. As witnesses walked into the cold air from the stuffy execution viewing area, fireworks erupted in the cow pasture across the road from Florida State Prison. There, hawkers sold burn Bundy burn t shirts and gold electric chair lapel pins. Dozens cheered when the hearse carrying his body drove by. Assistant State Attorney Bob Deakle helped put Bundy in the electric chair for the murder of little Kimberly Leach. As he watched the execution, his mind replayed vivid images of that April day in 1978 when her body was discovered. I'm satisfied that it's over, he said recently, but for some people like Kim Leach's family, it will never be over. Ted Bundy is a striking contrast to the general image of a homicidal maniac, attractive, self-assured, politically ambitious, and successful with a wide variety of women. But his private demons drove him to extremes of violence that make the gory worst of modern slasher films seem almost petty by comparison. With his chameleon-like ability to blend, his talent for belonging, Bundy posed an ever-present danger to the pretty, dark-haired women he selected as his victims. Linda Healy was the first fatality. On January 31, 1974, she vanished from her basement lodgings in Seattle, leaving bloody sheets behind, a blood-stained nightgown hanging in her closet. Several blocks away, young Susan Clark had been assaulted, bludgeoned in her bed a few weeks earlier, but she survived her crushing injuries and would eventually recover. As for Linda Healy, she was gone without a trace. Police had no persuasive evidence of any pattern yet, but it would not be long in coming. On March 12, Donna Gail Manson disappeared en route to a concert in Olympia, Washington. On April 17, Susan Rancourt vanished on her way to see a German-language film in Ellensburg. On May 6, Roberta Parks failed to return from a late-night stroll in her Corvallis neighborhood. On June 1, Brenda Ball left Seattle's Flame Tavern with an unknown man and vanished, as if into thin air. Ten days later, George Ann Hawkins joined the list of missing women, lost somewhere between her boyfriend's apartment and her own sorority house in Seattle. Now detectives had their pattern. All the missing women had been young, attractive, with their dark hair worn at shoulder length or longer, parted in the middle. In their photos, laid out side by side, they might have passed for sisters, some for twins. Homicide investigators had no corpses yet, but they refused to cherish false illusions of a happy ending to the case. There were so many victims, and the worst was yet to come. July 14. A crowd assembled on the shores of Lake Sammamish to enjoy the sun and water sports of summer. When the day was over, two more names would be appended to the growing list of missing women, Janice Ott and Denise Nasland had each disappeared within sight of their separate friends, but this time police had a tenuous lead. Passersby remembered seeing Janice Ott in conversation with a man who carried one arm in a sling, he had been overheard to introduce himself as Ted. With that report in hand, detectives turned up other female witnesses who were themselves approached by Ted at Lake Sammamish. In each case, he had asked for help securing a sailboat to his car. The lucky women had declined, but one had followed Ted to where his small Volkswagen bug was parked, there was no sign of any sailboat, and his explanation that the boat would have to be retrieved from a house up the hill had aroused her suspicions, prompting her to put the stranger off. Police now had a fair description of their suspect and his car. The published references to Ted inspired a rash of calls reporting suspects, one of them in reference to college student Theodore Bundy. The authorities checked out each lead as time allowed, but Bundy was considered squeaky clean, a law student and young Republican active in law and order politics, he once had chased a mugger several blocks to make a citizen's arrest. So many calls reporting suspects had been made from spite or simple overzealousness, and Bundy's name was filed away with countless others, momentarily forgotten. On September 7, hunters found a makeshift graveyard on a wooded hillside several miles from Lake Sammamish. Dental records were required to finally identify remains of Janice Ott and Denise Nasland, the skeleton of a third woman, found with the others, could not be identified. Five weeks later, on October 12, 
another hunter found the bones of two more women in Clark County. One victim was identified as Terrell Valenzuela, missing for two months from Vancouver, Washington, on the Oregon border. Again, the second victim would remain unknown, recorded in the files as a Jane Doe. Police were optimistic, hopeful that discovery of victims would eventually lead them to the killer, but they had no way of knowing that their man had given them the slip already, moving on in search of safer hunting grounds and other prey. The terror came to Utah on October 2, 1974, when Nancy Wilcox disappeared in Salt Lake City. On October 18, Melissa Smith vanished in Midvale, her body, raped and beaten, would be unearthed in the Wasatch Mountains nine days later. Laura M. joined the missing list in Orem on October 31st, while walking home in costume from a Halloween party, a month would pass before her battered, violated body was discovered in a wooded area outside of town. A man attempted to abduct attractive Carol Durange from a Salt Lake City shopping mall November 8th, but she was able to escape before he could attach a pair of handcuffs to her wrists. That evening, Debbie Kent was kidnapped from the auditorium at Salt Lake City's Viewmont High School. Authorities in Utah kept communications open with police in other states, including Washington. They might have noticed that a suspect from Seattle, one Ted Bundy, was attending school in Utah when the local disappearances occurred, but they were looking for a madman, rather than a sober, well-groomed student of the law who seemed to have political connections in Seattle. Bundy stayed on file, and was again forgotten. With the new year, Colorado joined the list of hunting grounds for an elusive killer who apparently selected victims by their hairstyles. Karen Campbell was the first to vanish from a ski lodge at Snowmass on January 12th. Her raped and battered body would be found on February 17th. On March 15th, Julie Cunningham disappeared en route to a tavern in Vail. One month later to the day, Melanie Cooley went missing while riding her bicycle in Netherland. She was discovered eight days later, dead her skull crushed, with her jeans pulled down around her ankles. On July 1st, Shelley Robertson was added to the missing list in Golden. Her remains were found on August 23rd, discarded in a mine shaft near the Berthet Pass. A week before the final, grim discovery, Ted Bundy was arrested in Salt Lake City for suspicion of burglary. Erratic driving had attracted the attention of police, and an examination of his car, a small VW, revealed peculiar items such as handcuffs and a pair of pantyhose with eye holes cut to form a stocking mask. The glove compartment yielded gasoline receipts and maps that linked the suspect with a list of Colorado ski resorts, including Vail and Snowmass. Carol DeRange identified Ted Bundy as the man who had attacked her in November, and her testimony was sufficient to convict him on a charge of attempted kidnapping. Other states were waiting for a shot at Bundy now, and in January 1977 he was extradited to Colorado for trial in the murder of Karen Campbell at Snowmass. Faced with prison time already, Bundy had no time to spare for further trials. He fled from custody in June and was recaptured after eight days on the road. On December 30th he tried again, with more success, escaping all the way to Tallahassee, Florida, where he found lodgings on the outskirts of Florida State University. Suspected in a score of deaths already, Bundy had secured himself another happy hunting ground. In the small hours of January 15, 1978, he invaded the Chi Omega sorority house, dressed all in black and armed with a heavy wooden club. Before he left, two women had been raped and killed, a third severely injured by the beating he inflicted with his bludgeon. Within the hour, he had slipped inside another house, just blocks away, to club another victim in her bed. She, too, survived. Detectives at the Chi Omega house discovered bite marks on the corpses there, appalling evidence of Bundy's fervor at the moment of the kill. On February 6, Ted stole a van and drove to Jacksonville, where he was spotted in the act of trying to abduct a schoolgirl. Three days later, 12-year-old Kimberly Leach disappeared from a schoolyard nearby. She was found in the first week of April, her body discarded near Sewanee State Park. Police in Pensacola spotted Bundy's stolen license plates on February 15 and were forced to run him down as he attempted to escape on foot. Once Bundy was identified, impressions of his teeth were taken to compare with bite marks on the Chi Omega victims, and his fate was sealed. Convicted on two counts of murder in July 1979, he was sentenced to die in Florida's electric chair. 
A third conviction and death sentence were subsequently obtained in the case of Kimberly Leach. After ten years of appeals, Bundy was finally executed in February 1989, he confessed to a total of 28 murders. This bio was taken from Hunting Humans by Michael Newton.